um, I'm a British female, I love this country and I give this country, now you're calling me a problem, I don't think I am, I think you are. Ever notice how people love to toss facts out the window during a heated argument, letting emotions run the show? This clash between Douglas Murray and some very passionate Muslim activists during an open debate is a prime example. But Douglas, cool as a cucumber, doesn't let the theatrics ruffle his feathers. Instead, he calmly dissects the emotional outbursts with razor-sharp logic. Let's set the scene. Intelligence Squared, 2010, with a packaged house and millions of viewers. It was a high-stakes debate with heavyweight speakers. Douglas Murray kicked off his speech by diving straight in, pointing out the glaring fact Islam, recently, has had some violent associations. That Islam is associated with violence. It was not Buddhists who flew planes into the Twin Towers. It was not Hindus or Jews that blew up the London Underground buses a few years ago. And that simple fact has to be acknowledged if you're even going to start a dialogue. Ouch. It's like watching someone drop a truth bomb at a dinner party. Awkward, but oh so necessary. Not exactly the best PR move, but hey, the truth hurts. It's not like we see monks from Tibet flying planes into buildings, right? Then, Murray shifts gears to the topic of rapid migration into Europe, comparing it to a historical tidal wave that even Moses might have struggled to part. In the middle of the last century, there was, or there was an almost negligible Muslim presence in Europe. At the turn of the 21st, in Western Europe alone, there were 15 to 17 million Muslims. That's a very fast migration, ladies and gentlemen, one of the fastest in human history. Not one to shy away from the tough stuff, Murray dives into the thorny issue of freedom of speech. If there were one thing I would wish Muslims in Europe could learn today, as fast as possible, it would be this that you have no right in this society not to be offended. You have no right to say that because you don't like something you can commit violence or you would like something to be stopped or censored. You have no right to have more hate laws or hate crime laws or hate speech laws just to defend Islam. You have to realize, the Muslims of Europe have to realize, that a society in which even your deepest feelings can be trodden upon is the only society worth living in. Imagine a world where everyone walked on eggshells. Boring, right? In a free society, you do not get bubble wrap. Freedom of speech means ruffling feathers and offending. What's the point if everyone just nods like bobbleheads? As if that wasn't enough, the Muslims also want a legal system in Europe to run alongside. Sharia law. Hear what Murray said about that. This is a fundamental problem and it's one we're going to have to deal with. It's a problem between a society, Western Europe, that believes that laws are based on reason and Islam that believes that they are based on revelation. Between these two ideas, I'm not sure there is very much compromise for Europe. The idea of parallel legal systems is as absurd as having different traffic laws for every neighborhood. Imagine driving down the street and having to switch from driving on the left side to the right side because you crossed into a new district. Sounds like a nightmare, right? Finally, Murray circles back to the core issue of societal integration and the failure of Islamic societies to uphold the same liberal values cherished in the West. Well, let me invite some uh, comments from the floor and um, let's go to the lady there, yeah. Um, I just had a question to Mr. Well, a few questions to Mr. Murray. Um, I don't think it's the Muslims of Europe that have failed. Mus uh, that failed. Sorry, the Muslims of Europe that have failed Europe. I think it's ex that exactly the opposite. Um, one of the things you said it was, um, yeah, it was actually a few Muslims, crazy Muslims, I think, who sort of flew the plane into those buildings. But was Hitler a Muslim by any chance? Because I'm not sure that Muslims had anything to do with the Holocaust. His argument here is crystal clear. It's not Europe that's dropping the ball. It's the refusal to integrate and uphold Western values that's causing the friction. It is a bold statement, but one that forces everyone to confront the uncomfortable truth about cultural integration. After this truth bombs, the audience's reaction is a mix of gasps, applause, and a few audible groans. And then, right on cue, a passionate Muslim activist stands up to challenge Murray, setting the stage for a verbal showdown. There was actually a few Muslims, crazy Muslims, I think, who sort of flew the plane into those buildings. But was Hitler a Muslim by any chance? Because I'm not sure that Muslims had anything to do with the Holocaust. Okay. 
Whoa, talk about bringing out the big guns. It's like she threw a grenade into the debate. The activist isn't just questioning Murray's arguments, she's challenging their foundation. And with the Hitler comparison? That's a debate nuke. How do you respond without sounding defensive? Isn't it a brag Hitler into this? It's like blaming your bad haircut on global warming. So, if Muslims are as violent as Europeans, why do they aspire to move west? Muslims across the world are increasingly aspiring to settle in western countries despite having more than 50 countries that identify themselves as Islamic nations. A report by jcpa.org shows that around 166 million people, largely Muslims, are willing to emigrate into the United States. The facts are startling. It's clear that most Muslims still prefer Europe to their countries. While the facts are out there, another activist didn't think that was enough. She still believes that Europeans are causing problems for Muslims. Just watch this. Um, I'm a British female. I love this country and I give this country. Now you're calling me a problem. I don't think I am. I think you are. Oof. That's a verbal punch if there ever was one. Scarfy isn't here to play nice. She's here to defend her identity and her community. But she doesn't stop there. Scarfy paints a vivid picture of her experiences with racism. As a Muslim female, okay, my parents might not let me go, go somewhere late at night because people are racist to me. They tell me to go back home and they hurt me. I got hit by two white guys and they laughed at me because I'm a Scarfy, okay? It's a gut-wrenching account, highlighting the real and personal side of the debate. Her question is simple yet powerful. Is the problem really the Muslim community or is it the society that marginalizes them? And then she throws a curveball. Um, about the point where you said um, about the religion, change in religion, every person has a right to. No one says anything about that. But if you had a daughter or um, a son that wanted to become a Muslim, would you be happy about that? I don't think so. Now, let's get real for a moment. Scarfee's question cuts to the heart of a common fear, the unknown. Many people worry about what they don't understand. If Mary's own child converted to Islam, would his views soften? It is a fair question, and one that pushes the debate from the abstract to the personal. Murray, ever the master of composure, takes the question head on. What we're arguing for is that people have the right to access all of the kind of opinions, all of the knowledge that they can. That means, among other things, having, for instance, access to all of the criticism that should be written of the Quran and of Islam. And if they weigh up after knowing all of these things and having access to all of them, that they would like to become Muslim, I don't have a problem with that. And just when you thought things couldn't get more intense, another activist steps up to the plate, swinging for the fences. This time, it is all about names and the stereotypes attached to them. This ride is about to get bumpy. When my daughter was born in 98, I called her Soraya, which is the Arabic name for Pleiades, because I felt that she needed to have a present for the rest of her life. After 9-11, people asked me whether I had regretted giving her an Arabic name. Her point is crystal clear. The mere fact of having an Arabic name can become a disadvantage in the post-9-11 world. And honestly, who can blame her for feeling this way? It's not like she named her daughter after a notorious villain. The activist takes it a step further. No, the point I'm making is, and I think it's the point the lady is making as well, that the fact that people are called Mohammed is probably in the perception of many, putting them in a disadvantage. Oh. And of course, I totally disagree. What this Muslim activist said might be true if looked at from one perspective. But looking at the bigger picture, there is something more to it. And Murray made it crystal clear. After the murder of Teo van Gogh in 2004, uh, he had to go under 24-hour protection because his name was found on a hit list from radical cell nearby. We cannot simply take, Petra, the terrific success stories. This is the point Douglas left the activist speechless. Yes, there are amazing success stories among Muslims in Europe, but, and it's a big but, we cannot ignore the dark side. Douglas Murray has been dropping truth bombs left, right, and center, and it's hard not to agree with his points. He's not just some guy ranting on a soapbox. There are solid arguments backed by facts. For instance, It is believed that Muslim migration is deliberately used as a kind of Trojan horse, being part of an organized invasion of Muslims into the West. And let's not forget the moral radical teachings. Yikes, that's some intense stuff right there. Is it any wonder people are a bit on edge? 
I totally agree, the points about the necessity of integration and maintaining Western values aren't just logical, they are crucial. How do we coexist peacefully if we don't play by the same rules? Are we supposed to ignore the elephants in the room just to avoid hurt feelings? Absolutely not.